Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Get Secure. My name is Mike Blangiforti, and I'll be your host on this January 27th, 2014 edition. Um, today, we're going to continue with part six of our Gilgo Beach serial murder uh, investigation and case. And um, today, I, I know everybody's used to seeing Commissioner Dormer, former Suffolk County Police Department Commissioner, on this show. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, the former Chief of Detectives of the Suffolk County Police Department, Chief Dominic Verone. Chief, welcome. Thank it's you. Great to have you. My pleasure. Um, Chief Verone, you spearheaded the uh, Gilgo Beach investigation from its inception. And just before we get into Gilgo, uh, can you just tell the viewers a little bit about yourself? I just they want to know uh, who you are. When did you come on the police department? Born in Queens, uh, raised on Long Island, uh, entered police service uh, back in 1972. Okay. And I put in 39 years. Uh, I rose through the ranks. Uh, I, I was fortunate to hold a couple of uh, detective supervisory positions and, and commanded so, uh, some detective squads. And uh, ultimately, I rose to the rank of chief of detectives, uh, where I served for the last two years. Um, mm -hmm. I retired December 31st, uh, 2011, uh, but the last two years of my uh, career was during this whole uh, Shannon Gilbert case, the serial murder case, and uh, that was a large part of our, my time, certainly in yeah. the last two years. Way to be baptized by fire into the chief of detectives role. Uh, actually, I was the chief of detectives a few years before that, and, okay. and we had uh, a number of cases, inc mm -hmm. including the David Laffa case, uh, that was big too. but. Uh, uh, I, w I was very proud and honored to serve as the detective commander and certainly uh, uh, with the Suffolk County Police Department. I'm very proud of those uh, years of service and certainly uh, very proud of what we did and, and how we contributed to this case. Yeah. And we thank you for that service. Uh, you know, okay. Certainly the folks of Suffolk County uh, should have been lucky to have you in that role um, right. for many years. Thank you. you. You say spearheaded and the only thing is, and, and, and I saw a couple of programs where you interviewed the police commissioner. And, and now you're interviewing me. Uh, it's important for the viewers to remember that we are the commanders and, and pretty high up the chain. Mm -hmm. uh, we oversee, we spearhead, but basically we're not the investigators, we're not even the lead investigators. There, there is uh, a homicide squad. In this particular case, we had a homicide task force, uh, detective sergeant, detective lieutenant, and those men and women uh, really are the nuts and bolts uh, and are the most important to the case. They're where the rubber meets the road, and they have far more knowledge uh, of the case uh, than even I do. So, uh, kind of a little disclaimer, when, when, when you hear us speak, understand that uh, you're getting it a view from the top. Absolutely. I mean, having served as a detective squad commander myself, uh, for many years. It's always refreshing to hear a chief talk about, you know, the folks in the trenches, you know, your detectives, um, the investigators. They're the ones that get the job done and they're the ones that make you look good or bad and for the most part it's, it's good. Yeah, well, I mean, as you know, we're doing a series on Gilgo Beach, um, so I'm going to bring you back to essentially the inception of the Gilgo Beach serial murder case and it started out with one missing person, um, prostitute, um. Uh, named Shannon Gilbert. Um, so let's talk about that inception and what, what was happening around that missing person's case when she went missing. Well, you know, just chronologically now, you're talking two years ago I left. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it was a very complex case, a very complicated case, and a lot of facets to it, particularly as we found uh, many more bodies. So I actually brought some notes. I'm not, I'm not sure if we're going to have time to get into any of the detail but just allow me to uh, refresh my memory if it becomes important to any of your questions. Absolutely. Yeah, Shannon Gilbert uh, uh, started the whole thing. Uh, most, of, most of the public and certainly your viewers uh, know most of the details and the circumstances surrounding uh, her disappearance and the search, the, the massive search, uh, that the sub unprecedented search that Suffolk County Police Department embarked upon to ultimately find her. Um, there are many today who still don't believe that uh, she may have had nothing to do with the serial murderer yeah. or that she wasn't murdered by the serial murderer. Yeah. That's uh, certainly something we touched on, but um, what, the inception of the case essentially started with uh, the disturbing 9-11 call. Um, is, is that how Suffolk County caught 
caught the case? Um, was she reported missing right after that 9-11 call? Or was it something that was discovered that she made that 9-11 call after she was reported missing? Yeah, probably your question, if I could answer it, I, I could clarify some misconceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know that, uh, you know, the, uh, Dave Brewer contacted her via mm -hmm. cell phone through uh, her driver and arranged for her to come out to Manhattan and she spent the night and that was uh, of course the evening of uh, May 1st, going into May 1st. And this was, a, it, was a, it was a Craigslist ad? Craigslist she posted and she had been posting. Um, she had, uh, living with her boyfriend in New Jersey, um, uh, she drives, uh, takes a train to New York City uh, where she's uh, contacting Johns and, and she's primarily using Craigslist and her driver is the kind of the go-between mm -hmm. and ultimately she ends up uh, with an arrangement to come out to Oak Beach uh, where she spends the evening at least a couple of hours which turns into the evening with uh, Dave Brewer. Mm. At some point in time uh, in, in the early morning hours uh, she dials 911 mm. and the turret operator asks her where she is and she has no idea where she is, but she remembers when she's driving out there that they had passed Jones Beach. So she, she remembers Jones Beach and she says Jones Beach. The turret operator then says, okay, that's the jurisdiction of the New York State Police. Doesn't get any more information from her, switches her call uh, to the New York State Police turret operator, who then engages in a uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. If I could look at the details here for a second. Absolutely. Um, she makes that phone call uh, at about 0451 hours uh, on May 1st. And she switched to the state police within two minutes. And now she's on with the state police for about 20 minutes, 21 minutes. And, and, and saying things like, there's somebody after me. Uh, they ask, where are you? <clears throat> she goes, I don't know. Um, are you in Suffolk County or NASA? All she knows is she's on Long Island. Mm -hmm. And she's acting rather incoherent, uh, mm -hmm. not very rational. A lot of pauses um, leading one to believe after we listen to the tape uh, that was she in some type of a drug-induced uh, stupor? Was she uh, having some type of a psychotic episode? But she wasn't acting very rational. Uh, we hear voices in the background, male voices, later turned out uh, determined to be Michael Pack, her driver, as well as David Brewer, or the John for that evening. Um, and Did you heard on the tape saying anything that was uh, distinguishable? Some of it is distinguishable, many of it is not, but consistent with what we later learned to be that he's having a problem with uh, he being Dave Brewer and it, it, he calls Michael Pack in to help control her or get her out. And she just isn't acting rational about it and almost paranoid, uh, crouched behind the sofa. Uh, they're trying to get her to leave. At one point, Dave Brewer puts his hands on her and she has a very negative, violent reaction to that, stands up and ultimately she runs from Brewer's residence. This is all captured uh, on this 911 call, which again, Suffolk County Police at this point have no knowledge of it. And uh, we then know that she runs to um, the residence of Gus Coletti. Um, she's with Gus Coletti at about 5.13 hours. She stays with him, um, very limited conversation, uh, knocks on his door, he goes, what's the matter? And he asks her, somebody after you? And she just kind of blank stares at him. And after a while, she just runs off and leaves. Uh, that conversation, that exchange is all documented. Uh, she runs off, we hear it. And shortly thereafter, we lose contact. The, the phone cuts out. Um, we believe that the battery uh, died at that point. She, was on, she had been on for some considerable amount of time. Did, did Coletti call 911? He did. He ultimately him? calls and says that there's a, uh, there's a girl asking for help and um, she seems upset and troubled, you know. 
Uh, and and he call, his call goes into 911. Suffolk County Police 911. Okay. And they're dispatched. Now, we now know uh, she runs around the road, down towards the water, and she ends up the, uh, 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 at the residence of a Mrs. Brennan. Yeah. And she's banging on the door. Um, you know, so we know she's still alive. Right. And she's asking for help. Mrs. Brennan is terrified, afraid to let her in. But she also calls 911. That's at about 5.30 a.m. Uh, Michael Pack, we know from Gus Coletti's description, as well as Michael Pack's explanation is that he's driving along looking for her. Hmm. Uh, so Coletti sees Pack? Uh, he sees, the last time he sees Pack is the, the SUV that Pack is operating mm -hmm. is going in the direction that she's seen going. Mm -hmm. Now, at what point does he lose sight of her? We're not sure. Um, certainly at the time, we considered the possibility that uh, he took control of her and, and possibly abducted her and possibly did something to her. Mm -hmm. But we now know that the facts uh, have the, you know, show that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Going back to Mrs. Brennan, she dials 911. Mm -hmm. So now the second call goes into Suffolk County Police. Um, that's at 5.30. Within 10 minutes, at, within, at, by 5.40, Suffolk County Police are on the scene. A one vehicle and shortly thereafter, a second vehicle. When they get there, they have Gus Coletti, they have Mrs. Brennan, but they don't have Mr. Pack, they don't have the SUV, they don't have a girl anywhere to be seen. At this point, they don't know anything about the 911 call. All they're getting is Gus Coletti's description right. and, and Brennan. Mrs. Brennan's description. Right. As far as anyone would reasonably be de determined, and it happens many times, uh, uh, in the spring, in the summer, boyfriend, girlfriend dispute outside of a party, husband, wife, boyfriend or, or uh, husband following them, argument, ultimately getting in the car and left. So it, it was reasonable for the officers to determine that they're gone. Um, however, they did look. They did do a cursory search of the area. And they were there within 10 minutes after the So that actually, that, that's, that's the important misconception. Mm -hmm. uh, Suffolk County police was, were on the scene within 10 minutes after she was still reported alive by Mrs. Brennan. Correct. That earl, earlier call and all that earlier information uh, that was given to the state police never finds its way into Suffolk County police hands until a couple of weeks later. Mm. Um, so th at that point, uh, when missing person detectives are aware of this 911 call to the state police mm -hmm. and the circumstances surrounding the calls by uh, Mr. Coletti and Mr. Brennan, now they're in a, in a position to, to realize, oh my God, you know, something is wrong here. And that's when uh, a more exhaustive search takes place. Right. At least that's when it's initiated. So now where was she reported missing from? Who reported her missing? She was not reported missing at that point. No, not at that point, but some, uh, sometime subsequent. W within, within a couple of days, uh, within two days, and, and don't hold me to the exact, you mm -hmm. know, that's all in, in the transcript and all records uh, in the case folder. Uh, but the sister and uh, the boyfriend come to Long Island to report her missing. Okay. And so now you have a legitimate missing persons case. When is the nexus made between the 911 call and the 911 call was that of Shannon Gilbert. Um, unfortunately, not for three or four weeks after the, okay. uh, the call. In hindsight, not that anything would have changed. Correct. Yeah. Um, we now know uh, by subs subsequent investigation and ultimately finding uh, Shannon Gilbert's body what we believe occurred. Mm -hmm. um, a woman, her, in some type of a emotional psychotic state, perhaps drugged state, uh, after she leaves Mrs. Brennan's house, mm -hmm. runs uh, up the roadway, there's a little pathway, which we believe she took, and ultimately brought her into this marshland, mm -hmm. uh, which she continues to run into. So she goes further and further, mm -hmm. losing items, uh, ultimately traveling on foot 
maybe a quarter of a mile where she ultimately succumbs uh, in thick bramble uh, uh, approaching Ocean Parkway. Yeah, now we know the, uh, the, the controversy is well documented, is that how did the police, how did the investigators make a determination between um, intoxication, drugs, uh, disorientation versus fear. She's scared because she's being chased. How, how, do, how do we, uh, well, how, how is that differentiation? Because, you know, the folks out there, you, we have what uh, Commissioner Dorma called the armchair mm -hmm. investigators, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people are probably curious about, well, how do we know as police investigators that somebody's in a drug-induced uh, stupor, um, they're intoxicated, they're irrational, they're acting uh, psychotic versus they're scared, they're being chased. How, how does that determination made? Those armchair detectives are really not arm, I mean, these are what actual detectives who had the case did. And, and they look and explore and think about every possibility and consider every possibility. And then you have to live by what the facts tell you. Mm -hmm. um, the facts tell you that she was safe with Mr. Coletti, but she didn't stay there. That's, that's critical. Uh, she was in safe harbor. She was away from whoever was chasing her. Um, all, all she had to do was await the arrival of the police and she would have been okay. But she stared at him mm -hmm. and somehow thought he was part of the problem uh, and, and ran off. Um, she bangs on Mrs. Brennan's door. She makes it to Mrs. Brennan's house, doesn't stay, runs off. Could she have been chased? Yes, but the problem with that is we believe whoever would have been chasing her would have caught her. Yeah. And the other um, question that I've always had is if, um, if she was being chased, um, there's two opportunities to run into somebody's home, right? Um, Coletti's home. Uh, he, he invited her in, didn't he? He said, you know, come yes. in, sit down. Um, Brennan calls 911. So there was, um, from what it seems to me, um, as a trained investigator and maybe part uh, armchair investigator, is looks like she had two opportunities to seek refuge. And away. Well, Mrs. Brennan didn't, allow, didn't let her in okay. uh, or didn't offer her that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Brennan was in there with, with mm -hmm. her mother, and, and she was very alarmed, mm -hmm. as most residents would be at that hour, someone banging Absolute, on the door. Absolutely. Uh, but um, you're right, though. But her state. Her, her state that we have documented in our 911 call on tape, um, her reaction to Gus Coletti uh, leads us to believe that she just ran off uh, in, into the, the marshland, okay. which is later uh, you know, supported by the facts. Okay. The way her items were found, hmm. um, one after the other kind of dropping as if someone running, right. losing one foot shoe, then the other shoe, and the manner and the direction of how the items are lost and how they're recovered and ultimately where she ends up. So we're very comfortable, uh, very confident, uh, although not totally, you know, conclusive. We, we, can't, uh, we can't say conclusively what, how, how she died, but we're pretty sure that this is what happened and she did not die uh, at the hands of the serial killer. What's striking, I guess, about uh, the case, and the commissioner I spoke about this, is that um, although there is commonality between Shannon Gilbert and the victims, the commonality um, seems to stop at, um, yes, uh, she was a prostitute. Uh, she advertised on Craigslist. Um, she saw to John in the Oak Beach area and the striking part about the case is that her, who has these commonalities with the victim, essentially leads the police, leads the Suffolk County Police Department to uncover a serial murder investigation. And that's what I think is striking, and I think that's where all the controversy uh, is, is created, because there are commonalities between Gilbert and the other victims, and essentially, if not for Gilbert, um, serial murders may still have not been discovered. So she leads you, she leads the Suffolk County Police Department to the victims, because it starts out as a missing persons case. Um, you had a geographical area where you know, it was feasible to search. Uh, you did, and then a body's found, 
And tell us about that. I mean, now we know that um, apparently you were looking, your body's found. Assumption is up. Uh, uh, maybe perhaps we found Shannon Gilbert. Yes, and going back to your larger issue and the larger question, it's, it's very true. And as unfortunate as the situation was for Shannon Gilbert, it did lead us to the find of a serial killer's dumping ground. Um, finding those bodies was very important, certainly to the, the families of those missing girls. And I think finding his area caused a great dilemma for the serial killer and, and perhaps caused him to stop killing. Yeah. Now we know um, when the first body was found, I mean, um, it's reported to you, I'm, I'm sure, that the body's found. How quickly, in my conversations with the uh, police commissioner, there was a unique um, thing about Shannon Gilbert and that she had a titanium jaw. So I'm assuming uh, from the time that the body's discovered to the time it gets to the ME's office, um, how soon before you're realizing, oh, no titanium jaw, that's not Shannon Gilbert, that's, we, have, we have a mystery victim here. Um, we, we didn't know that imme immediately. Uh, in fact, the immediate feeling of all involved was that this was Shannon Gilbert. Right. Um, at that point, we had just found that one uh, unidentified remains. We were very convinced that uh, it was Shannon Gilbert. Uh, we didn't know anything about the titanium jaw for, a, for mm -hmm. that took the medical examiner. You know, evidence is preserved, carefully lifted, is not examined at the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, it's carefully uh, uh, preserved and, and safeguarded and, and brought to the ME who later makes the determination. But um, we knew right up front from the manner in which the body was found that uh, it appeared to be the victim of a homicide. So mm -hmm. certainly the initial feeling was, oh my God, we found Shannon Gilbert mm -hmm. and oh my God, she's been murdered. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know our immediate focus what, what was led, what led to the homicide determination. Well, just the manner in which the body was found. Okay. Um, and this was not Shannon Gilbert's body, obviously. Right. Was Shannon Gilbert's body, uh, subsequently found a year and a half later, the way it was found showed that it probably was not the victim of a, a homicide. Uh, that it, it, it appeared that she just died from exposure and mm -hmm. kind of collapsed in, in some ramble. Okay, so you realize that, okay, the, the, the victim that's found, that's not Shannon Gilbert. We got, we got to get back, we got to get back in there to see. No, um, no. that's not the way it went. Okay. Um, as, as well as we act, worked on that crime scene, the homicide detectives and forensic people and the ME's office people, as much as they worked that area that day, uh, to their credit, they just expand the search each day mm -hmm. just for any trace at all that may lead to the killer or any evidence uh, that may have been involved uh, with, with the homicide of that first undiscovered victim. So it's more of an evidentiary search. Yeah, it's an evidentiary search for that first victim. And they're, 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 they're expanding the search, um, called it off for the weekend on Monday, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. They expanded it to the point where they came upon the second body. And there was, uh, it was uh, three bodies discovered that day, right? The second, well, then after that two, one, then they found three, two more. And four. Yes. Um, tell me about that notification. You're the chief of detectives. Um, two, three, four. What, what's going through your mind then? You get, a, you get that notification. Tell me what, tell me what you're thinking. Well, um, D Detective Sergeant Groneman, Detective Lieutenant Pelkowski, two very experienced detective supervisors are on the scene and it, it's very quickly clear to them that uh, these remains are all victims of homicide and they're similarly disposed of in close proximity so we immediately know that we are dealing with a serial killer mm. and now i'm assuming it was you that had to make that notification to commissioner dormer Yes, I actually notified Commissioner Dormer each step of the way. Okay. And, uh, you know, we're both surprised and perplexed by the find, obviously. Mm -hmm. And what was the game plan at the time? I mean, you're on the phone with the... You realize from the folks in the field, uh, wow, I, we, we have a serial murder happening right in front of us here. You notify the commissioner. Um, I would love to have been kind of like a fly on the wall with that conversation where you 
chief of detectives and the police commissioner of Suffolk County are having a conversation about what could be the most serious and severe case in Suffolk County history. You know, as any supervisor, but certainly as an experienced detective commander, you have to immediately come up with a game plan and prioritize your list uh, as far as what do we do next. Uh, who do you notify uh, in what order? Certainly the commissioner has to be briefed, the county executive's office has to be briefed, and the public's going to have to be notified. Uh, so those kinds of things are going through your head. What resources do we need? Uh, how big is this? And where do we stop? And uh, well, initially you pull out the stops, all, all hands on deck, all available personnel. You try to immediately, uh, you know, contain uh, what you found is all, also expand the search to find out what else we may find. Um, there's there's a, a number of issues uh, going through your head, uh, but you're relying on your people. You know, that's why... Uh, and speaking of relying on your people, I, I, in my interviews with the commissioner, um, what I saw as a difficult decision was made um, at the time after the fourth body's found, the decision to stop the search for possibly a couple of months. Uh, it was, you know, it was the winter time when the four bodies were found and then um, a determination is made, we, we, we got to call this thing off till the spring, till the, uh, how, how, tell me about um, how that determination was made. Well, it's, it's a very tough area um, to search. Uh, now, um, this is December where we're uh, actually finding, uh, finding these four four human remains and we searched the best we could and the initial search is based on what we found we found four disposed remains mm -hmm. off the shoulder of the parkway mm -hmm. not very far in you know we're, we're confident that the killer uh, pulled up his vehicle right alongside onto the shoulder mm -hmm. of the road as close as he could to the thicket bramble and removed the body from his vehicle and tossed the, the body as far as he could uh, into the bramble. He didn't go in very far. We don't believe he walked in. So most of the search that we concentrated on was along the shoulder uh, and, and into the bramble as best we could along the whole length of the parkway. Mm -hmm. And no other bodies were found at that time. And then the cold set, uh, right. set in. Uh, at the time, we only had one cadaver dog. We now have uh, three, and we ultimately utilized uh, Nassau County and the state police to assist us in that regard. But the, the, the you know, but the frozen ground and the frozen level and the thick thickness of the bramble, um, we we did as best the search we could, um, and then we figured we'd continue in the spring uh, after the thaw, and prior to the. Um, you know, the brush growing, the undergrowth, the poison ivy, uh, everything else that we had to contend with. So we had that window of opportunity uh, the following March. And a, uh, what really changed things for us, a very critical find, was the next uh, set of remains that were found. And they were found by a Marine officer mm -hmm. who himself was driving along the parkway. This is after the break in, in the investigation? Right, this is after the break. In the, was that a difficult decision? I just I, oh, no. I need to ask that uh, no. question. Was we it a difficult decision being that you had four bodies? You're probably figuring there's more out there. No, I mean, you know, you, we, we searched that initial area very thoroughly. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we searched the whole 10 mile area uh, very thoroughly along the same area. Um, when you talk about the marshland and, and, and square miles of marsh near Oak Beach and all the other area, uh, it, it's, it's amazing, vast yeah. undertaking. So no, there was absolutely no issue at all with stopping. In fact, at that time we felt we found everyone uh, yeah. that we would find. Yeah. But going back to the, the following March, mm -hmm. uh, the, the uh, Marine officer is driving along and he sees something much further in to the Bramble, again, mm -hmm. on the north side of Ocean Parkway, um, but much further in, and turns out to be uh, body parts disposed of in a different manner. Mm. You know, I'm not discussing anything that already hasn't been uh, mm -hmm. released to the media. I'm very hesitant to because this is an active uh, homicide investigation. We'll be but, but, what he, but, 
Excuse me? Will be until somebody's caught. Right. Uh, but his observation now changed our whole way of thinking. Now we found remains that were away from the roadway, well into the bramble, right. and disposed of in a different manner. And we realized we had to change our search mythology, uh, methodology, I should say. Um, at first, we utilized our emergency service trucks and had detectives uh, on top of the trucks riding along the shoulder, looking in with binoculars, because it was still almost too thick to penetrate on foot. And then uh, Stu Cameron and others, uh, the, the, the commander of the Special Patrol Bureau at the time, said, why don't we utilize fire trucks, which is an excellent idea. Uh, as far as I know, something that was never done mm -hmm. by any other agency, and fire tracks with their ladder apparatus, uh, if you recall the video footage at the time, sure. extended well into the bramble. Mm -hmm. And we had detectives uh, in the buckets really overlooking the bramble. Again, it's so thick, almost impenetrable by foot. And also, you don't want to step on anything to disturb anything. So this allowed them to peer over the miles and miles of area. And this ultimately led to the find uh, of the additional bodies. Mm. Now, okay, so the spring comes. We know that uh, you know, four bodies have been discovered. Spring comes, search resumes. What's the next victim that's found? Now, I know eventually it goes into Nassau County, but now another four bodies are still found in Suffolk County. And just yeah. as we continue with the segment, I just got to get permission from our producer to keep running the segment. Okay, and, and we're Well, <laughs> I think in the interest of not going over the ground you already covered, mm -hmm. I think uh, you went over with the commissioner, yeah. the other bodies and where they were found. Right. And um, We also talked about similarities uh, of the victims, um, identifying, and some victims are still unidentified as of today. We know that. We know one of the victims was a toddler, a uh, young girl. Um, we know that her mother's body is found all the way in Nassau County, although the toddler is found in very close proximity to another uh, victim. Uh, the similarities that have been uh, discussed with me and the commissioner, and whether it's something that was created, uh, or whether it's something that's active in the investigation, which you're certainly not going to get into, but um, the commonalities that we find out there is prostitution, uh, Craigslist, um, uh, asphyxiation as a manner of death, uh, bodies wrapped, and whether it's in burlap or something else, there's a wrapping of the bodies. There was a nexus um, that the commissioner and I discussed between um, the, everything leads back to Gilgo, but the commissioner spoke about uh, Manorville and remains found in Manorville. He spoke of Davis Park, uh, Fire Island, comes back to Gilgo. Um, and all of this is unfolding uh, under, under your command over the course of this year. Um, and I can't imagine, I know that we wanted to talk about uh, the overwhelming amount of responsibility that's placed on the chief of detectives and certainly those under his command on, on a case of this magnitude. And I just, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, the commonality. And, and, and this probably goes to there was there one killer or multiple killers. We know the four bodies that were found in close proximity to each other, the four females, um, we're very confident uh, in their close proximity in the matter of their, of their death that it was the same killer. So there's no doubt in my mind you have one serial killer there. Um, we know from the two bodies that were early, early, uh, at an earlier time disposed of in Manorville, parts were disposed in Manorville and parts were disposed of actually more towards uh, Oak Beach and, and, and west of uh, Gilgo Beach. But, but, but there's a match. There you have uh, our, uh, bodies that were disposed of similarly, at least two uh, women disposed of in Manorville and parts disposed in Gilgo Beach. So we know that that's the work of a serial killer, more than uh, you know, at least two, two uh, murders and, and, uh, but, and two separate events. You know, the question is, um, did the same killer uh, kill the two in Manorville um, and, and kill the, that killed the four others? And you know, most investigators would stay open. You know, we'd consider both possibilities. 
um, because the manner of disposal, some, some, some people, public officials, have stood up and, and, and clamored that because of, of a different manner of disposal, that it, it, it's a different killer, uh, because the MO, the modus operandi, is, is different. Um, but that's not th thinking in a broad sense, because MO is very important uh, within a narrow scope of time. Well, do you buy the two killer theory? Well, there's definitely one. Could there be two? Yes. Could there be one? Yeah, I, there possibly could be. And, and I was just going to that. Yeah. The MO becomes important when it's a, a very close period of time. When you talk many, many years, yeah. we know that killers change. Um, we know that the killer that killed Jessica Taylor and mutilated her body and dumped part of it in Manaville tried to remove the tattoo. This was the Washington, D.C. Yeah. Uh, she was identified because, because of that tattoo, right? Well, Tied back to a missing well, person's case. Well, let's, let's think, let's get into the psyche of, of, of the killer. Yeah, um, it's definitely something I always wanted to talk about on this show is, you know, the profile of a serial killer. Um, yeah, we have a unique serial killer here at Gilgo, but serial killers tend to also have commonalities. How do you profile the Gilgo Beach serial killer? How did he select his victims? What made them unique to him? Well, we know a lot about his selection process when we're talking about the, uh, the individual that killed the four, the four that were found together in the same manner, the more recent, a Amber Costello uh, 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 being the last. Those four, we know that he selected them uh, on, on Craigslist. Um, the you know, FBI behavioral experts will tell you that a, a killer uh, uses three factors uh, in, in, to select his victims, the victimology, if you will, um, their availability, uh, how available are they? And obviously anyone who posts on, on, on Craigslist is very available, um, very vulnerable. Once they allow themselves to get into a situation uh, with a killer uh, and they're alone on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, it's very, very dangerous. And the other factor is selectivity. And most often serial killers have a desire for a particular race a particular stature uh, of a victim, and this allows him that selectivity. He, can, he, he simply goes on Craigslist, chooses who he'd like, and, and uh, um, these girls, uh, they're in a dangerous occupation, but being very streetwise, they're very confident in their, in their abilities, and they're, they're very confident in themselves and the fact that they can talk their way or fight their way, way, way or get out of a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, this is proof that these street smart girls were not that smart. And, and once, he, once he pulls them into their web, mm -hmm. uh, there's no escaping. In fact, uh, you know, we met with people with the behavioral analysis unit uh, from the FBI, very helpful, and uh, they remarked, once they get in the car with, the, with this individual and shut the door, they're dead. Mm -hmm. So, uh, did this person would it fall into his profile? Did he, did he hate women? Did he hate prostitutes? Was it both? Um, there's, you know, it, it's very difficult to pinpoint the exact mind uh, of a particular killer and the dimensions of his personality, other than that they're psychopathic, sociopathic, um, a hatred, uh, perhaps for women. Um, a sexual desire, sexual needs that are played out. Uh, Do you believe that, that there was a sexual mechanism between the manner in which um, the victims were killed, the asphyxiation, and some type of a sick sexual pleasure? Did that ever come up um, during the course of the investigation? You know, obviously, a lot of those details we don't have. We could only theorize, but um, certainly, there's an empowerment that goes along with the sexual act. We believe, based on his conversations and based on the evidence that we could find, uh, again, with very uh, badly decomposed uh, remains, um, that these girls very well could have been uh, tortured, uh, certainly sexually abused, and certainly killed in a horrific manner. 
Um, I, I think the, the phone call to Melissa Bethelemy's sister is very telling, uh, very uh, tells you a lot about the mind of an individual so who the would... Voice of the, the voice of the serial killer is heard by the sister of one of the victims. Right. And for him to do that um, just shows how much of a sadist he is. Um, Sloppy on his part? Well, I wouldn't say that. I, I think he, he, he's, he, he's a very, very good planner, very careful, very methodical, um, not very sloppy at all. But I think um, uh, he, took, he took some chances. Again, with each killing, they learn, they become more empowered, and they're very confident that, uh, with the fact that they're not going to get away with it, that they, they're going to get away with it. Uh, I think the fact that we found the bodies that we did uh, is huge. I, I think uh, it, it put him in a state of panic, and uh, I, I think he's very concerned about where law, law enforcement is, and ultimately whether or not um, you know, he will be captured. You know, just, just to dispel some myths, um, you know, many think the individual is a dysfunctional loner. Uh, the past has told us that that's not the case. Very often these are individuals that have a family that fit in well with society mm -hmm. and uh, may have a, a, a good way of living. Wow, but disturbing. Very disturbing, disturbing, and very disturbing that um, he's still out there. And, uh, is he still killing? Excuse me? Is he still killing? I know you can't definitively well, answer that. It's more of an opinion question. We don't know. Um, another myth is that serial killers can't, can't stop killing, and we found that to not be true. Serial killers can stop. Um, it appears that he stopped in this area. Um, maybe not. Are you um, satisfied? I mean, I know you're retired now a couple of years, um, and, you know, and through this show, you know, I've gotten uh, Twitter messages, uh, emails uh, from, uh, from the viewers out there. Um, are you comfortable with um, where the investigation is today? Do you think law enforcement out there, um, do you think there's any connections to anything in New York City? Um, that um, past, present, um, do you think there's any connections to anything uh, that's been discovered in Nassau County? I've gotten emails about a body found in Oyster Bay. I've gotten emails from former detective squad commanders in the city that were asking about if uh, comparisons were made to body found in Rockaway uh, Beach. And um, are you comfortable that all of that has been explored? You know, I, I can't comment on the present investigation because I've been away from it for, for yeah. two years. Mm -hmm. And I have not been apprised of the details of where they've gone and where they're going. I can just tell you from my experience, and certainly as a, a, a police commander, your biggest job is the selection and deployment of personnel and putting the right people in the right positions. And, and right now they do have some very good people in there working on this case. So I'm very confident that uh, these leads that you speak of are being covered and, and ultimately, if he continues to kill in particular, he will be caught. Um, so I, I'm confident in law enforcement. How many tips came in? Oh, I, 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 couldn't, even, I, I couldn't even tell you. Uh, Had to be in the number. thousands, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And, 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 and probably not every one of them has been, uh, uh, been covered. I, I think it'd be helpful for anyone uh, to have someone who they think might be or could be mm -hmm. capable of doing something like this. And if, if you look at the times that the individuals, uh, the murder victims were last seen, if you look at the dates and times and you could make any kind of a common denominator uh, to someone you know who may have had the opportunity at that mm -hmm. time, uh, on those dates and times, anything any kind of information at all would be extremely useful. And, uh, Absolutely. And we encourage them. the viewers. I know the commissioner mentioned that the Suffolk County Police have a, a, a tip line um, that, you know, if, if folks out there, uh, if anybody's made statements, if anybody feels that there's something suspicious, and it's whether it could be a friend, it could be family, this is still an active investigation. And I think it's important that we continue three years later to continue to remind the folks that this is an active investigation still going on. 
Has somebody said something? Has somebody done something that concerns you? A family, a friend member, an acquaintance? Has somebody spoken about Gilgo that you might want to report to the officials? You could call the Suffolk County Police uh, tip line. 1-800-220-TIPS, um, uh, T-I-P-S. T -I -P -S. It's 1-800-220-TIPS, T-I-P-S. So remember, it's an active investigation. And um, now, we, we'll go. I just wanted to cover two more points before we uh, finish today's segment, and that's um, we spoke before. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, and the armchair investigators and so forth thought Shannon Gilbert was killed by the serial killer. Had to be, had to be, because she was a prostitute. She advertised on Craigslist. She was in Oak Beach, um, and she's found in the same exact place as all of the other victims. Essential, not all of them, but in the same proximity as the other victims. Um, Commissioner Dorma says, nope. You say, nope. That's not how it, that's not how it happened. Um, so the police investigation um, is, wasn't killed by the serial killer. Um, frantic 9-11 call shows up at two residences, runs into the brush and the muck, and the belief is what? The belief how is, she died? Yeah, what's the belief? How, okay, so we, we know about she went to Coletti. We know she went to Brennan. We know she disappears. The police respond. She's gone. She's found. She's, she, and running, she's running through water, mm -hmm. um, marshland, very cold, mm -hmm. very exhausted, tired, um, unknown what drugs, what she had to eat. We know she didn't sleep very much. I should mention that prior to leaving uh, New Jersey with her boyfriend, um, they went and saw the movie Nightmare on Elm Street. Hmm. Um, to what point did that act enter her psyche and, and her, her psychological state, particularly if she was involved with drugs? Um, and she ran off and she runs through the marshland. She's cold, the element's tired. She passes or, or succumbs to exhaustion and ultimately is, uh, succumbs to the elements. Um, but her, cl know, her clothes, is, she's found essentially naked. Yeah, but her clothes are discarded in a manner consistent with how one might lose their clothing running through uh, a marsh, at times up to your waist in, in, in water and mud. Um, look, we didn't close the book on that, but for the most part we very firmly believe that that's what happened with Shannon Gilbert. The tie to the Oak Beach uh, Gilgo area, the black cloud is over that area as if these girls were murdered there. We know that the, these girls, a woman, were murdered somewhere else. So they were dumped there. We have no idea where they were murdered. Um, well, we have some suspicions, but we certainly know that they weren't murdered there. So that takes away from the whole theory of the Oak Beach, Gilgo Beach uh, uh, area. And Brewer, last person to see, um, well, last John, not last person to see her alive, but the last John that uh, she visited, um, cloud of suspicion, obviously, over him um, when she goes missing. And certainly when the body's found, everything must go back to Brewer, to Pack, a driver. Well... Were they eliminated as suspects? Well, I, I, they've been eliminated as suspects in murder, in my opinion. However, they share culpability. Mm. They're certainly very culpable for this, uh, Shannon's death. Yeah. Um, Brewer solicited a prostitute. That's a crime. He may have administered a drug to her, with or without um, her willingness, with her consent. Mm. That led, contributed perhaps to her psychological state. Mm. Neither he nor Michael Pack made themselves available to the police that morning. If Michael Pack would have stayed mm -hmm. and waited for that first mm -hmm. responding officer who responded within 15 minutes and said, she's here somewhere, a much more exhaustive search would have been immediately conducted, sure. including of the marshland, which could have resulted in Shannon being saved. Yeah. So uh, Michael Pack and Dave Brewer, although, you, as you say, off the hook, for what I believe, that they were not involved in, in the murder. But they certainly contributed to her death. Absolutely. 
And just in closing um, today, and, and you know, and also thank you, thank you for your time today. You're uh, certainly, some great insights um, into this whole case, still active case. I believe that they're going to get the guy. I believe they're going to get this guy someday. I feel it. I feel it in my heart. Um, but what I want to end on today um, is something that's not necessarily related to the case, but your relationship with Commissioner Dorma and and how. You know, from the time that you're talking about all of this, how was that? How were those phone calls? The closeness. The um, did that kind of did it bring a department together, or was there um, separation of thought or disagreements? Well, you know, it, it was tough times for the department in many ways. Uh, union issues, um, many other political things going on. Uh, uh, that was very very tough. Uh, f for all of us, certainly the higher in ranks uh, in, in particular. But when it comes to something like this, uh, you know, nah, it doesn't matter. The chemistry was good uh -huh. between me and the commissioner, the commissioner and I. We, 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 we brainstormed and discussed a lot of things and, and we did our own armchair, armchair detective work. We're all, you know, once you get up to the higher right. levels and you're involved with overtime and budgets uh -huh. and deployment of personnel, uh, you want to be involved in the game, and it's certainly, it's it's more of providing the assets, uh, giving the the detectives and the detective supervisors what they need to get the job done, and supporting them, and running interference, and uh, handling the media, which we could spend uh, hours just talking yeah. about. Absolutely. How do you handle the media in a high-profile case? Uh, I'm sure a lot of long nights for you, a lot of long nights for the commissioner, and certainly a lot of long nights for the investigators and commanders on the ground. Yeah, uh, and, and still long nights and, and tough to be the commissioner and the chief of detectives in, in the middle of this big case mm -hmm. and to be pulled out of it and uh, know that he's still out there. Um, as you alluded, I think he will be caught. I hope he's stopped um, and I hope he doesn't resume. Um, and who knows, maybe he'll turn himself in. I, I hope that the case comes to a conclusion. I really, again, I just want to thank you for your time today. My pleasure. I'm hoping that if an opportunity presents itself in the future, we continue this special on Gilgo. Certainly, you're welcome back anytime, Chief. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming on pleasure. Get Secure. Okay. And folks, that wraps it up for part six of the Gilgo Beach Serial Murders today, January 27th, 2014. I'm your host, Mike Blanger 40 And remember to get Arrow, get Secure. Have a great week, everybody.